The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the ALEX webinar on Research Methodologies and Data Analysis, the second webinar of five in the Research and Publication Basics series. Thank you to Sage Publishing for their sponsorship of this webinar. I am Miriam Nauenberg, a member of the ALEX Continuing Education Committee. I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Eamon Toole. Eamon is Head of Research Support and Outreach at Columbia University's Science, Engineering, and Social Science Libraries. He received the 2016 Jesse H. Shera Award for Distinguished Published Research and is co-editor of the recently published book, Reference Librarianship and Justice, History, Practice, and Praxis. Eamon has published and presented on the topics of critical information literacy, library instruction, critical reference practice, and questioning narratives of grit and resilience in libraries. Eamon brings considerable experience to today's topic, and we are fortunate to have him with us today. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is ALCTS. C -E. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions box on your screen. We will have time for questions during and after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded. You will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now, here is Eamon. There will be a slight delay while we change presenters. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Eamon Toole. Thank you, Miriam, for that introduction. Um, I am the head of research support and outreach for Columbia University's Science, Engineering, and Social Science Libraries. Um, so welcome. I've included my Twitter handle and email here on the slide. Uh, so if you'd like to get in touch with me at any time for questions you might have, um, you're welcome to. And I'm very happy to be speaking with you all today. I've had the opportunity to learn about and try out many different methods in my own research, and I really enjoy sharing out that knowledge to encourage more research and more critical questioning among librarians. So today we'll be homing in on a couple important steps that come right after you've found a topic and determined your research questions. Uh, in particular, we'll be focusing on identifying and selecting the right research method, as well as how to go about analyzing and making sense of the data that you collect. So if you're a librarian in tech services who wants to do research but doesn't know exactly how to start, uh, you've found the right place. So uh, research and how it's approached I think is very much shaped by one's experiences and interests, and so I want to briefly share my background and relevant experience. I've done quite a few different research projects uh, related to library public services, like reference and instruction, as well as on student research habits and library use. On some of these projects I've done just by myself. Uh, some were co-authored with one or two other people, and occasionally they've been done with a large group of people across multiple libraries. So I really enjoy trying out new methods. <laughs> That's a fun part of research for me. Uh, because the questions I'm exploring are always fairly different, I've never used the same method twice. Um, so that means I've used quantitative methods like statistical tests, uh, qualitative methods, uh, including interviews and focus groups, and text-oriented approaches, uh, as in doing a close analysis of a visual or written text. Uh, in 2015, I had the good fortune of attending the Institute for Research Design and Librarianship, which is an annual application-based program held for librarians and archivists who want to expand their understanding of research methods and publishing. Uh, and in 2017, I participated in a panel at the ACRL conference on conducting qualitative research. Uh, including data analysis and potential pitfalls to watch out for. 
Uh, so there's my relevant research experience and some of those areas that I'm most familiar with. So in the next hour, we'll be covering a lot of ground. Uh, my goal is to introduce you to several research methods relevant to librarianship and tech services and how the question you want to answer will determine the method that you use. Uh, in addition, we'll talk about options for data analysis procedures and programs. We'll look at some examples from the professional literature, and I'll conclude by sharing a few sources for learning more about research methods and data analysis beyond today's program. So given the range of topics, I want to take a poll to help me get a better idea of what to spend more time on. Um, so here's that poll. Uh, it asks, um, where are you in the research process? So please fill out the poll and select as many responses as apply to you. And I'll give um, everyone a few moments to respond. Give it another moment or two. Okay, so let's see the results of that poll. All right, so, all right, interesting. So we can see a lot of people are interested in learning more. Uh, that is always a good quality to have. <laughs> um, having a topic uh, or research question ready or analyzing data. So. Definitely different points of that process represented, um, which is great because we're going to be addressing all of those. <laughs> and then, of course, there's other, which naturally we'll get to with some uh, Q&As throughout the presentation and um, definitely at the end. All right, great. Um, well, thank you for participating in that poll, and let's head back to the presentation. Thank you. Great. All right, so next we'll consider the... Uh, connection between research questions and research methods, which uh, is a, a truly important part of designing a study. So your question should guide which method you use, and we'll take a look at what that means. So for me, the most exciting thing about research is it allows us to better understand our world, including questions we have about our work, uh, and that's where research questions come in. So research questions typically begin with a problem we want to understand, uh, interest we want to pursue, uh, but inspiration for that can come from anywhere. Uh, in uh, library instruction sessions, I always tell students that coming up with a topic for a paper is one of the most difficult parts of writing, right? And that's true as well for research projects. Um, so you do want to seek a question that is answerable or at least explorable uh, and that it contributes knowledge to the library literature uh, and that often means narrowing down a question uh, which you can do by considering things like um, who, what, when, or where. And you also want to consider the originality of your research question and that will require a look at the literature to see if that question is covering new or possibly different ground. Um, perhaps most importantly, and you'll hear me mention this again once or twice more, is you want to take stock of the time and resources available to you uh, and decide if the project that you set out is achievable given the support that you have. Uh, if not, you can narrow down the question to make it more manageable. Uh, and finally, a question that <laughs> always puts me on the defensive um, but it's still useful to keep in mind as you research and write, uh, which is, so what? So that question of what's the point, so what? Uh, this keeps the purpose and implications of your topic up front and helps make it clear why people should be interested in what you're studying. So um, again, not a fun question, but something useful to consider. Uh, so with that overview of developing research questions, Let's look at what that has to do with methods. Okay, so a uh, single question can be explored and understood in many different ways, uh, and that's exactly where the method comes in. Uh, methods act as different lenses for viewing phenomenon. 
uh, understanding user experiences with uh, subject headings, for example, could be understood through numbers, um, such as investigating the most commonly used subject heads in a catalog over a period of time. But it can also be understood through conversation and dialogue, such as how users perceive subject headings and how they choose to interact with them. So both are considering the same topic, uh, but produce very different understandings of it. Uh, so this comic here shows an <laughs> example of that. Uh, asking a quantitative question, uh, how many people prefer quantitative to qualitative, yields quantitative information, right? So when asked to explain why, a qualitative approach suddenly becomes necessary. So with that, we see that certain questions are best suited to certain methods. Um, so we'll get into that further as I describe the difference between these methods. Uh, but for now, let's look at a quick example. So here's an article, a uh, snippet from an article on evolving technical services functions and large research libraries uh, by Jiun Yoon Davis. And this was published in Library Resources and Technical Services. So the author has four different research questions that they're exploring. And they all fall under that umbrella question I've highlighted, uh, which is, how is technical services changing? So a big question, right, with some um, subsets to it. But in looking at those questions, we see that they all ask what, along with a couple mentions of how and why. Um, and we can see that these are questions that investigate motivations, actions, and are pretty complex. So let's see what method the author chose for that. So given those questions of how tech services is changing, they decided on interviews, which are a qualitative method. Uh, additionally, they spoke with tech services directors from an interest group, which is a good way to limit uh, what could potentially be a large group of respondents and selecting just representatives from that interest group. Right. So a quick example, and we'll look at some more later on in the presentation. So I've already mentioned qualitative and quantitative a couple times. So it's uh, time to look a little more closely at what exactly these different approaches mean and which might be best for your particular uh, research project or your topic. Okay, so uh, a single question. Uh, well, let's move on. So you generally think of quantitative as based on numbers and qualitative as non-numerical information, um, which is true, <laughs> but there are a lot of other distinctions that are important to make. Um, so they are often described as competing with each other, as one versus another. But the truth is um, there's actually, you know, there are different ways to answer the same questions, and they can be used in a complementary way as well. So this slide is really breaking down to differences they have in terms of interests and key questions. Um, so are you interested in measuring a phenomenon or having the ability to generalize your findings to other settings beyond your own institution? Uh, if so, it sounds like you want a quantitative approach. Um, however, if questions that require context, exploration of a topic, instead of making hard and fast claims, uh, if that's more your speed, then it'll likely be qualitative. So the keywords involved will also help signal which approach will best suit your questions. Um, what and especially how many are often amenable to quantitative, while how and why are best suited to the exploratory, uh, people-oriented nature of qualitative methods. Um, and we're still generalizing somewhat here, so let's drill down a bit into the key features of the two different approaches. So quantitative research is used to quantify a problem or question by way of generating numerical data. Uh, conclusions about a particular question are drawn based on analyses of the data, such as testing for statistical significance. Quantitative research is used to quantify attitudes, opinions, behaviors, or other defined variables, um, which is why identifying measurable characteristics and defining them 
and uh, determining a population is essential. Uh, similarly, you'll be relying on a scale for measurement, most likely, uh, whether that's one that's found in the literature or one that you develop yourself and validate. And the use of scientific scales is to improve objectivity, consistency, and replicability, uh, all of which are highly prized qualities in quantitative research. So essentially, uh, we're using structured data collection methods to make observations and correlations. So here's some characteristics to consider to see if your research is a good candidate for a quantitative method. Uh, first and foremost is that you're interested in those quantifiable, measurable questions. Uh, if you can't quantify it, then you'll want to look somewhere else for a method. <laughs> uh, likewise, quantitative methods are best when people's actions are not central to what's being investigated. Um, other reasons to select quantitative include having results that stand up to scientific scrutiny and preferring to have your research design determined in advance instead of um, having to adjust things as you go. So with that said, here are some actual methods to consider. Uh, far and away, surveys are the most popular method in librarianship, uh, quantitative or otherwise. And that is because uh, surveys are relatively easy to design and conduct, so there isn't a high bar to entry. Um, and <laughs> by the same token, surveys tend to get a bad rap for that reason, but it is actually actually and absolutely possible to do a high quality study based on survey results. Um, the trick is really just investing time in developing a strong survey questionnaire, which means pre-testing your survey, and using an appropriate sampling method, which means something more rigorous than convenience sampling. Um, but surveys are useful to get a wide range of insights in a short amount of time, and that data is uh, usually easy to compare and report. Uh, secondly, content analysis is an interesting method that's really a combination of quantitative and qualitative. So this involves interpreting and coding what is usually textual material, and that means developing themes based on a specific body of material. So um, as examples, some content analysis studies I've seen in LIS look at um, job advertisements to see how requirements have changed over the years, um, looking at professional documents like standards from ALA or library mission statements um, with the goal of analyzing what these documents say and mean. Uh, other options can be fairly simple in the data collection stage, um, like with observing and recording events, um, really um, making use of existing data quite possibly, um, data that's already been collected but is just sitting in a system. Um, at the same time, there are some important considerations here, especially with patron privacy, but uh, certainly one good way to jumpstart a project is to uh, take a look around and consider what's already available to you in terms of data. Okay. So that brings us to qualitative research, uh, which generally seeks to understand behaviors, experiences, and opinions about a topic. It is often exploratory and provides insights into a problem on its own, as well as develops ideas or hypotheses for potential quantitative research. Qualitative is really used to uncover themes or trends across a particular group, uh, especially in terms of social activities. And so being based on people's experiences, uh, their interpretations or observations is very useful for dealing with complexity and nuance and can get very granular and detailed. Um, of course, the flip side of this is that the process, um, and especially with data analysis and developing themes, can take a lot of time, right? So it's very time intensive. Uh, the good news is that the sample size or the population that you work with will typically be small. So with a quantitative study, uh, for example, we'd be seeking hundreds of survey responses, uh, whereas for interviews, we really want 10 or 15 participants maximum. So you want to use a qualitative approach if um, these scenarios resonate with you. Uh, obtaining detailed and also unexpected data 
is one big advantage. Uh, it tends to be thorough and it very frequently involves people. That's another aspect. And having the ability to go off script and pursue an interesting tangent, um, such as in an interview or focus group, is another notable benefit and something that quantitative research doesn't really allow. Um, and so going along with that, there tends to be more room for error. So if you set up a survey and later discover a problem, uh, you're really stuck with that for your results. Um, however, if you have an interview question that seems to confuse participants, uh, you can change it and it's much less of a big deal or something compromising the integrity of your results. So here's a selection of the most common qualitative methods, especially in LIS. Um, so one-on-one -on -one interviews are a popular method that allow for extended conversations in person, uh, even over email, as I've done in one study, and they allow for very uh, rich data and conversations on a topic. Um, focus groups uh, can present a challenge in that they usually need a skilled facilitator, but similar to interviews, they provide really fascinating information and insight into people's opinions um, just in a group setting. Um, then unobtrusive observations are often done in conjunction with, um, say, assessing library space and how it's used, and that can mean camping out somewhere or walking to different locations and taking notes of what is happening there. Um, cognitive mapping is uh, gaining popularity as a user experience method in libraries, and that uh, asks users to draw their experience or understanding of something. So it's really interesting stuff, um, maybe uh, of how a library database works or the different places they visit in a library or on a campus. So it's a very visually oriented method. And then reflective diaries are another option for hearing directly from people or patrons on what they're thinking and why, uh, and especially over a longer period of time, like a semester or longer. All right, so up to this point, we've uh, talked only about quantitative and qualitative methods. And while those encompass a lot of different approaches to doing research, there are a couple other options I also want to point out. <laughs> so no shortage of <laughs> things to consider here. Um, so mixed methods is a very robust approach that uses both quantitative and qualitative methods to get the best of both worlds. So when the data is compared, it can have a complementary effect that has both a numbers-focused lens along with a second lens that asks why and how. So one popular mixed methods approach is a survey followed by interviews. Um, that way you can get a broad perspective and recruit interview participants with the survey and then you can dig deeper into those questions uh, through interviews. Uh, the only drawback here, of course, is that it takes more time. Uh, action research is another promising approach that is especially well-suited to librarianship because of its focus on practice. The goal is really to assist the researcher in solving a problem, so it's very solution-oriented. Um, that can mean a long-standing issue in an organization or just something that someone's recently encountered. And so action research usually involves making a change to a current practice within a work setting and observing the effects of that to see if improvements were made. Uh, and then we have user experience methods, which overlap a lot with qualitative, but they have their own flavor because they represent immediate and actionable issues relating to how people use something. So there's a lot of potential for UX methods to improve library websites, resources, and services. And there are uh, many uh, fairly low stakes approaches that can be used, um, including card sorting, uh, there's A-B testing, and even um, eye movement tracking uh, for website development. All right, so I want to um, pause and take a question or two since um, there's uh, quite a lot to discuss with just methods alone. Um, so please submit your question to the chat box and our host Miriam can select um, one or two for me to answer before we move on to the data analysis section. And if we don't get to your question now, uh, there will be time for Q&A towards the end of the webinar as well. So let's hear. Yeah. 
Great. Thanks, Eamon. We've got one question that's come in so far. The question is, where do things like case studies or autoethnographies fit in? Ah, yes. Excellent question. So, um, case studies are interesting in that I think they might be most aligned with like action research um, and really kind of seeing how a practice works and using that example um, to kind of draw larger conclusions. Um, so a little bit action research, a little bit qualitative. Um, and autoethnographies, which I'm uh, glad um, the question asker mentioned, <laughs> is an interesting method um, that's definitely uh, qualitative um, because autoethnographies really are uh, based on one's experience, right? So writing about, um, say, your um, year in a new role at a position and um, your different experiences um, personally, that would be considered autoethnography. Um, so that would, yeah, be qualitative because, again, there's no data, you know, no numbers that are being involved necessarily. Um, it's just about that experience and personal aspects. So great question and a good example of how that quantitative, qualitative, plus other methods really um, doesn't always fit in a neat box. Yeah. Great. And Eamon, I have a question. What is an appropriate number of research questions? In your example slide, I think in your first section of your presentation, there were four research questions from mm -hmm. that example. Uh, mm -hmm. Can a person have too few or too many research questions? How does that all work? Yeah, great question. Um, I don't think there's such a thing as too few, but there definitely is such a thing as too many. <laughs> so um, I would recommend really limiting down to uh, two research questions. Um, if you just have one question that addresses um, everything you want to know in that study, that's great. Um, fewer is often better in this case, um, but sometimes two or even three questions can be good. Um, the mm, difficulty is just getting sure that there's a scope that you can handle within one study or one article because there's only so much you can address in you know, 15 pages or so. Um, so that's a way to set things out so it's manageable and achievable. But let's start out with one, two, or up to three. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah. That is it for our questions for this point in the presentation. So Eamon, I'm gonna turn it back over to you uh, to continue right. with the presentation. All right, excellent, thank you. All right. All right, so We've covered a good amount of ground with looking at the main types of research methods that you might want to adopt. Um, but the next question naturally becomes, uh, what do you do once you have all of that data? Right? So that's what we'll get into next uh, with the process you'll generally adopt for data analysis and the most appropriate uh, program, if applicable, for the job. So the procedure that you use for data analysis will change depending on uh, many factors, really, including the amount of time and support you have, any variations on the methods you use, um, things like that. So what I want to provide here is just a quick roadmap for what to do with your data if you go the quantitative method route. So even before you've collected your data, uh, think about the type of data analysis that will be required. Uh, it could be that you're not looking to prove, say, correlation between two variables, and you just want to compare results through percentages and straightforward uh, descriptive statistics, which I have here summarized as you know, percentages, averages, um, things like that. Uh, these are easy to calculate, and descriptive statistics are a good way of kind of summarizing um, quantitative information quickly. Um, on the other hand, we have inferential statistics, which allow you to develop results um, and conclusions about a population. So um, you can't record information regarding your entire population in most cases, but you can draw some conclusions based on a sample and using the appropriate statistical test. Um, so these types of tests can get complicated quickly if you don't have a math, math background, like myself. <laughs> but with a few Wikipedia entries and YouTube tutorials, um, you can gain an understanding of 
which test is going to be appropriate for different scenarios. And so for one study I did, for example, I um, knew I needed to do a t-test um, and it took a fair amount of <laughs> Googling and um, YouTube tutorials, but I was eventually able to do that in Excel, right? Um, so regardless of the data analysis you do, um, you want to start thinking about uh, which type you might want to do early on. Uh, next, you want to identify the best program for your data analysis needs. So two essential questions are cost and time, uh, particularly whether you'll need to invest time in learning a new program uh, for descriptive statistics and uh, even some statistical tests. Excel works pretty well and it's readily available. Um, and there are plenty of other programs to consider and we'll talk about those more uh, in a couple slides. And then comes preparing your data. So this can be time consuming, but uh, it really is key to take your time with this step to ensure your results are valid and free of errors. Um, so that really just involves reviewing your data before it's analyzed, removing any errors that you find, and separating out the different variables um, so that it makes sense to the program that you selected for the analysis. So if you're working with qualitative data, uh, you want to have different considerations in mind. Uh, the first and most important step is going to be getting to know your data. So after doing so, you'll have a much better idea of what's potentially significant about your findings and how to analyze that data. Uh, very often when you're using qualitative methods, that means transcribing from audio recordings that you've made, um, and that way you're working with written documents instead of just verbal information you've collected through interviews or focus groups. You can better analyze it that way. Uh, I have transcribed interviews a couple times before. I uh, used some free software and a transcription pedal, uh, which is low cost, uh, but it does take at least four to five hours per hour long interview. And so there's a big time investment. Um, on the other hand, if you have money for a transcription service, it'll be in the range of a dollar per minute of audio. Um, so if you have, say, 10 interviews at an hour each, um, it can add up. So, you know, considering both approaches um, as slow going as it is, I like that transcribing my own interviews allows me to become more familiar with the data I collected. Um, and regardless of which, which approach, um, whether you do the transcribing or not, you'll definitely want to read and reread um, any data sources you have to get to know them and take some notes as you go. Um, oh, and I'll head back here. So there are a lot of steps. <laughs> so the next step, uh, considering a software program, is really up to you, what you're comfortable with. Um, there are several approaches to coding and thematic analysis. Um, grounded theory is a popular one that you may have heard of. So um, first review those different um, ways of analyzing themes and see what makes sense for your project. Um, and I, let's see here, I recommend always coding by hand first, um, just since it doesn't take much time to try, and you can see if that generates useful themes and insights. Right? So um, if not, uh, you can try out a program designed for qualitative data. Um, so the themes can be identified through um, many different types of analysis, um, you know, depending on the project, the researcher, and whether you're working with someone else, um, that number of themes can be extremely granular or very broad. Right? So, um, you know, it's about considering how often they arise in the data, um, how important they appear to be to participants, and uh, what they have to tell you about your research questions. Um, and it could be that you have completely unanticipated findings that don't relate to your research questions, and this can tell you more about your library or questions you haven't even considered before, which I think is exciting. Um, and for me, that's the best part about qualitative research. You'll very likely learn things that you didn't expect or um, even know to look for in the first place. So now that we've covered the data analysis procedures generally, uh, what they'll be for quantitative and qualitative, and here's a selection of programs to consider. Um, so they all really vary <laughs> in, 
in complexity, but especially for beginning researchers, I highly recommend starting out with something simpler and then moving up to the next level if that doesn't suit your needs. Um, another consideration is whether your institution has access to one of these programs, since subscribing to something robust in the intermediate or advanced levels uh, can cost quite a bit. Uh, for quantitative analysis programs, I included Microsoft Excel here, which is, uh, again, all you really need for descriptive statistics like averages and percentages, but it also works surprisingly well for simple statistical tests like uh, t-tests and ANOVA. Um, second down is SPSS, which is widely known as the standard for more uh, complicated inferential statistics. And then there's R, which is a programming language um, that uh, definitely takes some learning for uh, beginners or even people who know a bit about the program. Um, on the qualitative side of things, we have Deduce, uh, which is a easy to use uh, web-based program and it offers a monthly subscription. Uh, so because it's web-based, uh, it's also a great option for collaborating with other people. Um, and Vivo is a second one down, which is a very popular program for working with larger volumes of data, uh, performing more complicated or detailed analyses. And then there's Atlas TI, uh, which is uh, very sophisticated and definitely has a significantly steeper uh, learning curve as well. <laughs> so there are many programs out there, but these just give you an idea of what to start with and um, what to expect. Okay. All right, so let's take another pause for a question from the audience. Um, like last time, uh, please submit your question to the chat box and Miriam can select one for me to answer. And Again, if we don't get to your question now, uh, there will be some time for Q&A at the end as well. Okay, Eamon, while we're waiting for any questions to come in, um, mm -hmm. here's a question for you. Um, you'd mentioned on your data analysis procedure slide when you were talking about quantitative research, you mm -hmm. talked about the types of data analysis, descriptive and inferential statistics. Mm, yes. You kind of touched on this in your talk, but how, how hard are those methods for people who don't have really any math background beyond, <laughs> let's say, you know, algebra or trigonometry. Yes. Um, many close. folks come from a humanities background. So yeah. can you talk yeah. a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So um, for the more simple descriptive stuff, um, a lot of times that may be all you need for a project. Um, if you're not trying to prove that, um, one change correlated with something else um, or, you know, more complicated types of analyses like that, it's really um, plenty. And for a lot of the um, expectations within the library literature, um, again, descriptive statistics are fine. Um, if you do want to <laughs> get a little more into um, inferential statistics, um, you know, I have a, a literature background and I'm absolutely not a math person, but I was able to do um, some um, t-tests and um, look at an ANOVA testing. So it's really about, mm, I guess, <laughs> how um, enticed you are by finding out <laughs> that correlation or determining some conclusions and the amount of time that you can invest in, in doing that research. So it is absolutely doable, but, um, not at all a, a requirement either, so, yeah. Great. And we have a question that's come in through the box. Uh, this person's asking about, this is a great question, they're asking about um, different examples that you gave for qualitative and quantitative research, but mm -hmm. applied to technical services. They're uh, kind of interested in questions related to technical services workflows. Can, can you give any advice there? Hmm. Well... Yes, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I have some examples that I think will be um, useful in um, getting some ideas. So I do admit my background isn't as much in the tech services literature and uh, much more in kind of methods to apply, but especially as applied to 
um, the public services side of things. Um, so workflows, though, in particular, I think are really interesting to consider for uh, maybe an action research approach where you make a change to a particular workflow, you see how that, um, how that worked out, um, or maybe a UX testing type of method. Um, so again, it would involve a little bit of work with, say, maybe users, or maybe it's just the librarian side of things, but um, doing some kind of um, card sorting or kind of um, project mapping um, could be an interesting way to look at that. Um, depending on the, the scale and, and question that you're um, interested in, yeah. Great. Well, that is it for our questions at this point in the presentation. So, Eamon, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and then we'll take any final questions that the audience has at the end of your presentation. Perfect. Thanks. Great. All right. Yeah, so um, as a question hinted at, it's uh, definitely one thing to you know, talk about different methods in the abstract, but another to see examples of these um, different methods in action and how they've been applied, um, and then what they do when they are put into action. So for the next section, we'll take a look at uh, four recent studies that have been done on topics and journals related to tech services and um, consider the methods that they chose. So the first example uh, comes from the journal Evidence-Based Library and Information Practice, and it addresses the usability of ebooks. Um, so as we might guess based on the subject, um, the authors adopt usability testing for the study's method. They do say academic ebook usability. <laughs> so we can see from their objective here, which I've highlighted, that the authors, well, that they, the research question or intent that they have, aka objective, um, is comparing those different ebook platforms in terms of usability and user satisfaction. So to investigate this, the authors identified a sample population uh, who are students at the University of Colorado Boulder and uh, specific usability tests that they apply, uh, one of these being the Think Aloud protocol. So because usability testing provides some quantitative results, but is primarily about participants' experiences and opinions. Um, the results are based on those aggregated recommendations um, from the participants. So example two brings us to a fairly different method, which is content analysis. So in this study, the author analyzes job advertisements with the emphasis on those for serials and continuing resource catalogers. So by considering the qualifications for these positions and how they changed over time, uh, the study can infer trends uh, incurring in the specialty. And the research process here is um, primarily about defining the job ads and the time period that's within the study's scope. So deciding what that is and sticking to it. Um, then obtaining those job ads and qualifications and encoding the levels of experience and of uh, requirements into different categories. So again, kind of um, categorizing that data to make sense of it. Our, the classic uh, survey methodology comes up in an article from Library Resources and Technical Services uh, from last year. And we can see how the study um, really plays to the strengths of that survey method, as well as um, how important determining the scope is for a study. So the author asks about uh, RDA implementation, specifically in the top 100 largest public libraries in the US, and associated questions about whether some of RDA's goals have been accomplished. So a survey is a great option for this because it allows for opinions from a large range of participants without expending a massive amount of time, as you would with interviews, for example. And the data that you get won't be as rich, but for a state of the field kind of question, um, surveys work uh, quite well. So here we get into a more complicated method. Um, QSort is a combination of quantitative and qualitative methods. 
and it addresses the usual qualitative concerns of experiences and opinions with quantitative analysis. So as a method that seeks to um, study people's viewpoints, it is well suited to uh, this research topic, which is catalogers' personal values and their perception of their institution's values. And so those patterns that are identified through data analysis are helpful in determining implications and uh, future research questions. So overall, you know, there are many well-established methods that are useful, um, and this one in particular adopts kind of a unique combination of quantitative and qualitative for this particular type of question. So to wrap up today's program, I want to um, share out a few resources that I found useful in doing my own research. Um, these include a couple websites that discuss various aspects of the research and publication process for librarians specifically, as well as a selection of books and articles on research methods and data analysis. So in terms of first-hand accounts of conducting research as a librarian, um, the Librarian Parlor, which is at libparlor.com, uh, I think is really unparalleled. Uh, the people who run the website solicit pieces on a variety of different topics um, that range from setting a research agenda to spotlights on featured researchers. Uh, and the tone that they have is very approachable and it's uh, very much intended for beginners. And so I definitely recommend everyone take a look there for uh, realistic advice on doing research. Um, another website that um, functions more like a reference source for research methods is uh, the Librarian and Researcher Knowledge Space, uh, known as LARCs. <laughs> so if you're looking for a primer on different methods, and this is going to be a great place to get additional ideas uh, for methods to pursue and uh, what they might look like in LIS. So a couple websites to check out. And of course, there's no shortage of um, books and articles written about conducting research either. So <laughs> here's a brief selection of the ones that I recommend starting with. Uh, the first book here, Research Methods for Librarians and Educators, is uh, very practical and straightforward and really delivers exactly what the title says. Uh, it fills a needed space, I think, in research method training for librarians um, since the most recent edition of a similar book is from 10 years ago at this point. So I'm glad to see that published. Um, John Creswell, who co-authored the second book here, is widely known as the foremost authority on designing and conducting research of uh, many different types. Um, and his books are popular for balancing rigor with accessibility. Um, so for the most part, if it's a book by Creswell on a method or approach that you're interested in, um, you can't go wrong. Uh, Pat Baisley is another expert in methods, and she specializes in qualitative approaches. So this book of hers is widely known as a key text for working with uh, qualitative data. And then lastly, there's an article by Morris Smale on working with your institutional review board. Um, so if you're doing research involving people, um, you'll need to go through the IRB at some point, um, submit an application through them. So this article is a very helpful look at the types of projects that would require IRB approval and how to go about getting that approval for your research. Um, so that's all I have for you. Um, we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, we've talked about figuring out what you want to know and how your research questions determine your method. Uh, we looked at the major methods like quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods. Uh, we looked at kind of the procedures and programs for doing data analysis and considered a few examples of methods and practice from the library literature. Um, so at this point, we can turn it over to uh, Q&A. Looking forward to hearing any questions you might have. Um, and if possible, I know it's tricky with research where the questions can get um, or need to be specific um, so often, but 
uh, if you are able to keep your question general, um, that way it'll have more meaning for everyone um, and maximize everyone's time. And again, if you have any questions that come to mind after the webinar, um, feel free to get in touch with me uh, by Twitter or over email, uh, which are included on the slide. My Twitter handle is at amentool, and my email is amentool at columbia.edu. Um, so with that, um, looking forward to hearing what questions you have. Great, thank you so much, Eamon. This has been very interesting and very informative, uh, speaking as someone with no research background at all. <laughs> and I appreciate very much your willingness to share your expertise. So um, opening up now to the audience, as Eamon said, just we have time now for some final questions. So if you haven't done so, please enter your questions in the questions box. Okay, Eamon, here's a question for you. With surveys, um, what kind of response rate is recommended in order for your data to be valid, if that makes sense? Yeah. Well, what, do you, what should a person shoot for in terms of how many people respond and how right. many people should be surveyed? Yeah, excellent question. So this is a, a rare case where there's a very specific answer <laughs> to that question about the response rate. Um, so generally, you're going to want to have uh, a 30% response rate to a survey. Um, so if you um, survey 100 people in the total population possible, um, you want to receive, if possible, um, about um, 30 responses back. Um, so that's considered a standard uh, response rate. If it's less than that, uh, it's not the end of the world, but it's definitely something to uh, shoot for. Um, and if, uh, say, you have a 10% response rate, then that would be um, something where you might want to reconsider, um, maybe do another push for a survey, something like that. Um, so it'll depend a little bit. Say you send out a survey to a huge population, like all the students at a university, um, that response rate expectation will still remain the same as if it were with the smaller group. Um, but you also don't want to be surveying, um, say, um, 20 people. That would be considered uh, too small of a population. So generally, 100 people and up um, is a, a good population group uh, for a survey. Yeah. And then a follow-up question, what is the best way to survey individuals? Do you mail surveys? I, we see yeah. a lot of stuff on the discussion list with just electronic surveying. What, what have you found is most convenient right. for people? Yeah, sure. So um, a great question and one where it depends um, on the population you have. So with email surveys, uh, on one hand, they are very convenient. Uh, they're easy to send out and they're easy for people to respond to. Um, however, for a lot of people receiving the survey, it's just another email. <laughs> so it might get deleted and um, email surveys tend to have a lower response rate in general. Um, so something to consider that I've actually had uh, more success with at um, my institutions is doing a paper survey. Um, so if you have something available in a kind of highly traffic spot, um, that's a good way to um, get feedback, even in additional, um, additionally to an email survey. Um, you can have an email sent out with follow-ups. Um, and one thing that uh, we did for a big uh, survey kickoff at uh, my previous job was we made a big um, kind of event out of it. So we were um, beginning this big ethnographic study but the first step was doing a survey. So uh, we had <laughs> librarians wear t-shirts um, announcing, you know, the survey that was happening. <laughs> Very exciting stuff. <laughs> we had a popcorn truck that was brought into the library. So I'm really um, emphasized <laughs> in person that survey that was going on that they would have seen an email about or could fill out in person. 
So um, definitely different ways to drum up interest. Um, and another option um, to follow up on that would be to have an incentive. Um, so maybe there's a gift card um, for survey respondents and um, people's names are drawn randomly for that. Um, maybe everyone who enters gets um, a very small, maybe um, giveaway from the library, something like that. It's also good things to consider for uh, increasing that response rate and reaching a wide audience. Great. Thank you very much. So we've got time for one more question. We've got a couple minutes left for questions. So a question that came in was, do you have any comments about the reproducibility of library-focused research? Should method statements have that in mind? Yeah. Um, the short answer is yes, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, reproducibility is a, a great point to bring up and um, really something that um, you can take on as a researcher uh, and promote um, as you research and, and publish. Um, so one thing that really aids reproducibility um, and, you know, the, the chance that someone will be able to um, do your study in the same way that you did and um, compare those results with their population is um, clearly uh, delineating the steps that you went through. Um, so starting with that um, data analysis process and going through to the program you used, if applicable, um, to, you know, all the steps involved um, just one by one. Um, there's somewhat of a balance of including too much detail, but um, in general, I haven't seen a study that <laughs> I've complained about including um, too much information about reproducibility. So describing it clearly and also including in the appendix, which is something that I think a lot of um, authors forget to do when submitting a study. So including focus group questions, um, if you had those, including a full survey that you sent out, um, maybe including, you know, interview protocol, uh, any sort of instrument um, or questions that you used to um, involve that those participants and do your study will be really useful for reprodu reproducibility purposes. Great, thank you. We have some remaining questions that were submitted, so our presenter, Eamon, has kindly offered to answer them in writing. Uh, those answers will be emailed to our attendees when we send out the slides and the recording. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, look forward Great. to those. Thank you very much, Eamon. We're glad that you could all be with us today. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELECS Continuing Education Committee plan future events. The email will also include links to today's slides and recording. You now have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance. That information will also be in the email. Thanks again to our presenter, Eamon Toole. Thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Joseph Nicholson and Iping Chen Gaffey, and to Alana Warren in the ELEX office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. ELEX has other continuing education events coming up. Next Wednesday, March 13th, we will offer the second webinar in our two-part series, Digital Preservation, Audiovisual Edition. Additional webinars in the five-part Research and Publication Basics series are scheduled through May 8th. Please see the ELEX website to register or find more information on these events. ELEX also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Our next e-forum will be March 19th on knowledge-based management. Please check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Thank you all for joining us today, and this concludes our session.